from the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Danda, and today I have my lovely co-host, Vera Mehet. Hey Vera, how you doing? Hi Paddy, yeah, I'm in good spirits today. Even better to see that you're wearing my favourite colour. Oh, the uniform. Yeah, the brand colours. There we go. So Vera, how have you been? You know, what, what's been happening with you in the last few weeks? I've been learning a lot. Um, taking more time out for learning than usual. Mm-hmm. I didn't plan for it, just lots of things came my way. Like I was at a women in tech conference yesterday, agile, virtual workshops and all this sort of thing. So I've just been, I've had a lot in my mind I've been chewing. Um, what about you? How have you been? Yeah, all good. I've been presenting at a few virtual conferences and I've got one face-to-face next week, which I'm really excited about. So yeah, on the same theme of learning and talking about learning, I think our next guest on this episode links in quite nicely when it comes to learning. So Vera, who do we have on the show? Would you like to introduce them? Sure. So we have Stephanie Darville, who knows a lot about learning because she is a co-founder and COO of Align Learn Better which is a Swedish tech startup. And also a fun fact about her is that she's recently been listed as one of the top 100 women in social enterprise in Europe. And another fun fact, Paddy, pay attention, is that she's a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. So oh, wow. she's got, yeah, she's got a whole set of skills. That's probably the wrong symbol to do. I don't know what the Taekwondo symbol is. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much. That's a very nice, a very nice intro. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. I was thinking, well, what is the first question I could ask Stephanie? And I thought it would be really nice to just jump straight in there and get to know you for our listeners and watchers as well, like your personality. So what is three words your best friend would use to describe you? I, that's a big question. I mean, this is the first time we're meeting, but I feel like I'm uh, having a catch up with some old friends. So it feels very, very nice to be here. What would a friend uh, describe me as? I think they'd describe me as uh upbeat uh, and energetic well that's two words so upbeat energetic and also very organized <laughs> i'm not sure that's the most fun explanation but i think that's that's one word that would definitely come up quite often okay because that's interesting to have that mix in your personality just from you know looking into some of what you've done you seem quite adventurous outgoing and spontaneous, but at the same time you're organized. So it's interesting to have that mix of being organized yet being up for adventure. That's like we've been stalking you on Instagram or something, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can admit it. We, we live in a world where we always do our background research, but I think, I think it depends on the context I'm in as well. And also your interpretation of what organized or having structure is, I think. In the, in my work, I'm definitely known for the person that, you know, does have the structure for, for the good and the bad, probably, that's always reminding everyone to put everything in one place. And I'm very sort of structured in that way, in that I know what, what needs to be done. But on the other hand of that, in my personal life, I don't like making plans very far in advance. I like spontaneous plans. I'll often turn up late in my personal life because I'm just, you know, a bit more laid back about that. So I think, yeah, it depends on on which context you put me in, that I'll do it. And I pro- I don't fit in too well in Sweden by not wanting to make plans very far in advance as the Swedes really like making plans like even a month in advance. And I can't do that for me. I think one week ahead is is as far as I can look into the future. And talking of Sweden, so you're, you're British originally. How did you get to being in Sweden and starting or being a co-founder of a startup in Sweden? 
So I came to Sweden in 2017. So actually it's, yeah, five years now, which is crazy. And I came for a four month project with my work at the time. I was working in the travel industry and I had been moving around. I'd been changing countries every three months for two and a half years. So this was just one more <laughs> um, thing. And I thought, I'll just be here for four months and, and then I'll, and then I'll head somewhere else. Um, I'd done Spanish at university and I'd lived in Latin America. So I thought, I'll probably go to a Spanish speaking country. And then five years later, I'm still here. So I think every time it just, again, I said, I don't like to plan too far in advance. Every time I just made the decision to stay for six more months, six more months. And now it's been five years and, and a year, just over a year ago. So a year and a half ago, the opportunity came up to, to start in a program, which is where I met my two co-founders and we started Align. And I think everything just, yeah, kind of went with the flow and it worked out very well. And yeah, Sweden's a great place to be. And especially being as a startup, it has quite a, a, a lot of people like to call it the Silicon Valley of Europe, or maybe just Sweden makes that up for themselves. But there's a lot of startups that are coming out of, of Stockholm, especially. So it's a good place to be. It sounds fascinating, the fact that you've gone there for one purpose and then ended up sort of sticking around for something else, which is a whole new adventure. I guess, just in terms of your decision-making, how did you decide you want to become an entrepreneur? Like, was that something you had as a, as a childhood ambition or was it just spur of the moment? What made you jump in with two feet? Definitely not a childhood ambition. I think I, I, I never really planned to be an entrepreneur as such. It wasn't like I, I thought it was my life, lifelong mission. Growing up, I didn't have that many people that were entrepreneurs. So I think it didn't get into my mind. But I did used to say, even when I was working in the corporate world for large companies, saying that I do want to start my own company one day. I'm just not sure what in, but I think I would really like it and I would thrive in it. And, and I used to sort of say that quite often, but I just wasn't sure what. And then I think once I met my co-founders in St. Emmanuel and we started talking and talking about learning and wanting to provide a platform where it's easier to, to learn and also get evidence of that learning, everything kind of fell into place and felt like, okay, now's the time. So I think I'd always felt quite entrepreneurial in a way, but hadn't really found the right platform to express it. Got it. And what have been some of the challenges with you kind of jumping into this world? What what have been some of the things that have maybe surprised you? That there's there's been so many. I mean, I think what people don't tell you, you often get painted the beautiful picture of the, all the successful startups coming out of Silicon Valley, and I think uh, it's hard work. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of self doubt, which I think often you don't really prepare for as much. You know, you're going to have days where you are so convinced that you're on the right path and you really believe in what you're doing and the journey you're on. But you're also going to have some days where you're, you know, stressed because there's a lack of certainty and you just think, is this, is it now? Is this the right time? So I think that's one of the things I've definitely like some of the challenges I think has been. I've definitely felt quite a bit of imposter syndrome now, which I know is also like, I know it can be, be very common amongst women as well in leadership positions. And I think I sort of have to look back and go, no, you, you've deserved this place. But sometimes I do feel like they're going to be on to me or when we have a wider team now and people are coming to us, me, my advice or decide the direction of a project. I'm also like, why are they coming to me? What do I know? Oh, wait, no, I'm the leader of the company. Okay, now I need, to, <laughs> I need to answer this. So there's times I have to keep reminding myself, you know, it's not luck that I'm here. I have worked hard. And of course, there's a certain degree of luck in terms of the stars aligning. But uh, at the same time, like my hard work has also got me here. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, the closest thing I can think of for me is becoming a parent. I'm a parent of two kids and... I'm an only child, so I really never had small children around me or even growing up looking after anyone else's kids. And so even now, there's, they're 10 and 12. I do sometimes sit there and reflect and go, oh my God, am I really a father? And am I qualified? Because I definitely don't feel I am. And so I get kind of where you're coming from on that. Uh, obviously, I can't uh, empathize in the same way. But Vera, how about yourself? Have you ever felt imposter syndrome in anything? Oh, goodness. I think... <laughs> 
through most of my career. <laughs> but you know what? It, I don't think at first I was aware that it was bothering me. I think it spurred me on to think, oh, I should learn about that. So I did a chemistry degree, but I really wanted to get into tech. I don't know why, but I was really excited about tech. I started off in a smart meter company and I was going around the whole company figuring out what to do. I was just seeing all these skilled people. I thought, I don't have any of these skills. I don't belong anywhere. <laughs> Where do I fit in with, in a company? But then that spurred me on to think, okay, I better go and get started try and do my own self-learning to get to where I want to be, to try some things out because I don't know what I want to do. But that's what I find really inspirational finding out about you, Stephanie, because you haven't been afraid to just try things. I mean, like obviously Taekwondo, you're stuck with that, traveling to another country, being an entrepreneur, even though you'd never done it before. So how did you get the confidence to just give something new a go and stick with it? A good question. And I'd also say I definitely have been afraid to try these things, but I've just kind of, I try and flip the, you know, when I feel very anxious and I do suffer from anxiety, so it happens a lot, but I try and change that energy into, you know, okay, use all these nerves as, you know, and put that energy into actually making the most out of the opportunity. So I definitely feel anxious when I, when I take a new step or, you know, a big leap, but I think it's a gradual process. Like each leap you take, you take that leap and you're worried everything's going to crash and burn and then you do it. And actually it's a great experience. I always say like win or learn, you, you know, either it's a su success or I've learned from it. And then you become more confident to take the, the next leap because you can reason with your mind that actually, you know, last time we were anxious that everything was going to collapse and fail and it didn't. So maybe this one won't, but it's, it's definitely a lot of conversations against my own brain and mind. And I do think, I mean, you mentioned about Taekwondo and I, I think any sport is great, especially from a young age and kids getting involved in it, because I do think that my experience in Taekwondo and I competed in it for 10 years, that is taught me a lot of what entrepreneur what I need to be an entrepreneur in terms of the perseverance and the determination and getting knocked back quite literally in Taekwondo but you get knocks and you get hits and and you have to keep pushing forward and I now I realize that a lot of my sporting background those are such transferable skills that are of the valued to realize how much of an indication it is on your personality and how you perform as a professional what inspires you to keep learning because I guess, you know, you go to school, you've been to uni, you've done all your learning. Some people might think, well, I'm done with it now. No more exams for me. What inspires you to keep on learning? I think the constant curiosity. And I think a lot of people do think just learning is when you're a kid. And, and actually that's schooling. That's not learning. That That's just one area of it. And things change so quickly. You know, if you think about when you're at school and what you were taught, it's so different from the landscape that it is today. So I guess... What inspires me is like constantly being curious about, okay, what's the new information there? And in in a way, it's also quite fun because there, there's always something more to learn. You know, it's almost a race that will never finish because there's always picking up different aspects. And, and I think one person, at least, that's inspired me to always keep learning is my granddad, who is 92 or 93 right now he'll kill me if i get it wrong i think he's 92 but he you know still learns every single day and he still travels uh, by himself often to different countries or he's reading new plays or books that he finds interesting and i really think like he is the epitome of you know lifelong learning and so seeing him at that age still being very curious i realized that okay you're definitely not done learning when you're 18. Oh, that's making me think of my granddad now. He's off in a different country on his own at the moment. I don't know how he's doing it, but he just he's just more disciplined than anyone else in the family, more healthy, more energetic. I, I feel like the older generation are more resilient as well. And that's definitely a skill worth investing in, learning how to develop for the times that we're in. I was the type of person who, I didn't have a great experience at school and in my early education and Soon as I was done with university, I felt I was done with learning. I was one of those people and never wanted to sit another exam. Just, just detested anything to do with studying ever again. But how wrong was I, as we know? 
you know, we've got to constantly learn it just to be able to survive in the current digital chaos that we live in. And now I work for, by day, a large training organization. So yeah, I'm kind of like you, Stephanie, that I'm in this world where if you don't learn, you're just not going to be able to do your job. I'm still not a big reader though. That's one thing I wish I could do more of. I don't know about you guys. Do you read many books? Because that's something I've really struggled to do. I've got a whole shelf full of books behind me, probably a third of those I've read and, and not the rest. So I don't know. Is that something that you guys find difficult? It looks nice the background though. <laughs> 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 you know what, Steph, I've actually bought a book that you recommended. You recommended Invisible Women. I've started reading that. And lots of people in my workplace are reading it. Um, and it's not just the women promoting it, but the men too, which is brilliant. What do you uh, think of it? Is it is it blowing your mind? Yeah, I didn't even know that there was this gap in data gender-wise. And so suddenly I'm realizing, wow, this is like, there's real data behind this. There's a reason why we can find it a struggle to sit in, but then it makes you think, well, there are actually things we can do about it to make it better. We can just deal with this and, and improve things. So yeah. Is there another book that you've been reading recently that you'd recommend? I mean, the that book, Invisible Women, it's by Caroline Criado Perez, and it really blew my mind when I first read it because it, it exposes the data bias in society where the world has been built for the average human which is considered as a 70 kilo like 5 foot 10 male and so everything is built everything we do our desks our phones our screens even like gun proof vest bulletproof vest they're all designed for, for that one person it doesn't consider any of the other genders or you know how that implicates health and 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 safety in in society. So that's one of the biggest sort of like wow moments or aha moments I had recently well and when I read it one of the other books that I really like, and it's becoming, there's several interpretations. One book I've read is called Atomic Habits um, by James Clear, which is about how you can tiny or small changes make, uh, small changes make a huge impact. Might be on the shelf. It's on there, one that I haven't read yet. There's another one called Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, which is a very similar concept as well about, and, and, Ultimately, it reminds you to be as productive as you can, or even when it comes to learning. Yeah, when you think about, you know, reading one whole book or doing an entire course, that seems very overwhelming that you're almost tempted just to stop. And it's about like, like they talk about it's behavior equals motivation, ability, and prompt. And so if you have the prompt, for example, the prompt could be leaving your book by your bedside table. That's the prompt to trigger you to do it. The ability, you have the ability to read, but maybe you don't have the motivation. So you need to work out which part are you missing of the puzzle to be able to build that habit. And that's one thing that I really like and try and build into my everyday life because I find it very overwhelming. And, and I, I'm a big reader, but I'm not a huge listener. So, you know, one of my friends, one of my co-founders even, he listens, um, basically only listens to audiobooks and podcasts. That's his way of learning and ingesting content. And we're all different learners. Whereas if I'm listening to something, it's either music or it's a podcast, which is entertainment. I, I can't listen to learning content. I don't know why. So for me, I need to visually see it and then I can sort of interpret it and log it. So everyone is different in how they learn. I'd say, Paddy, if you don't like reading, don't read, you know, if you don't like running, don't run. Whereas a lot of people feel they have to, because society tells them they have to. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, Steph, because for years I was trying to launch a blog and I had this website set up. I did all of the creative stuff. I created the logo, created everything, like all, all of the fun stuff. Then it came to writing and I literally, I'd write an article and about a week later, I'd look at it again and I'd rip it up, start again, rip it up, start again. And it's one of those things that it was never good enough. And I just felt it got to a point when I thought, you know, I can't do this. I'm not going to bother. So in the end, I knocked it on the head and I thought, I think I need to create content in other ways that I enjoy. And hence the podcast. I think uh, the podcast has been amazing for me because I can just be myself without putting in too much extra effort and work. And it's something I really enjoy. So I think you're absolutely right. You've got to find... What works for you? Now, if someone said to me, hey, Paddy, do a YouTube channel and you'll do one of those quirky videos where you're just talking at the audience. 
couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Or at least I, I'd find that very uncomfortable, just me sat there talking to the camera on my own. Okay. And so that's why I think this format works a lot better.